Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for April 12th through 18th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 37 through 40. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Can't wait to learn what you have to teach. It's so exciting, and now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 15 minutes, 51 seconds. And what would that be on a daily basis? That would be 2 minutes, 16 seconds. Oh, that's easy to do. Lots of time to study. And time codes are here if you want to go section by section. And now, John, give us a recap. So last lesson, we talked about Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partridge going to visit the prophet in New York in December 1830. So this is the end of the year, 1830. Each of them received a personalized revelation. If you'll remember, Sidney received DNC 35. Edward received DNC 36. And now Joseph is working on his translation of the Bible and Sidney is acting as scribe. Let's talk a little bit about that translation of the Bible. We mentioned that briefly last time, but we thought we'd take a little bit of time and talk about it in a bit more detail. First of all, there are a lot of questions that people have about the Joseph Smith translation, and the church history topics, remember we've mentioned that before. Great resource. Really great section. Yeah, and 187 really interesting articles. They have one on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. We thought we would tease you into going to read it for yourself by reading bits of it here. So here's some information from the church history topics on the Joseph Smith translation. While translating the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery found they held different views on the meaning of a passage in the Bible. They mutually agreed to settle the question by the Urim and Thummim. As a result, Joseph received a revelation giving the translation of an account by the ancient disciple John, written on parchment but lost to history. We talked about this back in Doctrine and Covenants section 7. This early experience seeking revelation that expanded the text of a Bible passage was an important precedent. About a year later, during the summer of 1830, Joseph and Oliver received by revelation an account of a vision of Moses, not found in the Old Testament. This revelation marked the beginning of Joseph Smith's efforts to prepare an inspired revision or translation of the Bible. For the next three years, Joseph continued work on this new translation of the Bible, considering the project a branch of his calling as a prophet of God. Joseph Smith did not employ Hebrew and Greek sources, lexicons, or a knowledge of biblical languages to render a new English text. Rather, he used a copy of the King James Bible as the starting point for his translation, dictating inspired changes and additions to scribes who recorded them first on paper and later as notes in the margins of the Bible itself. His revisions fall into several categories— long-revealed passages, and smaller changes that improved grammar, modernized language, corrected points of doctrine, or alleviated inconsistencies. As he worked on these changes, he appears in many instances to have consulted respected commentaries by biblical scholars, studying them out in his mind as a part of the revelatory process. Joseph proceeded from Genesis 1 through the Old Testament until a revelation in 1831 directed him to advance to the New Testament. Once finished with the New Testament, Joseph picked up where he left off in Genesis and completed his work on the Old Testament by July 1833. After Joseph Smith's death, the Bible translation manuscripts remained with his wife Emma until she gave them to her son, Joseph Smith III, who led the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Reorganized Church, now Community of Christ, published Joseph's revisions in 1867 under the title The Holy Scriptures, Translated and Corrected by the Spirit of Revelation, but the volume quickly became known as The Inspired Version of the Bible. Brigham Young, then president of the church, expressed skepticism of the accuracy of the inspired version, having not had the chance to review the manuscript sources himself. 
Despite possessing a handwritten copy of some revision manuscripts, the church under President Young's direction and thereafter did not publish an edition. During the 1960s, our LDS scholar Richard P. Howard and LDS scholar Robert J. Matthews each studied the manuscripts to authenticate the published editions using the original texts. The reorganized church made manuscripts available and granted the LDS church permission to publish excerpts as footnotes and endnotes in the 1979 LDS edition of the Bible. Continued research from this collaboration led to the publication of the complete Bible revision manuscripts in 2004 and again as part of the Joseph Smith Papers. Now, is that interesting? We think it's interesting. That's great stuff. You can read the whole article over on the Church History Topics of your Gospel Library app. But if you are interested in some bonus content, there are some articles in the Enzyme, which are wonderful. There is one called the Joseph Smith Translation, Plain and Precious Things Restored by David Seeley. Also some great articles in the Enzyme by Robert J. Matthews. You'll remember we mentioned him in the article that we just read. We're going to link three of these in the description. Very informative, very helpful if you want to know more. Also, on BYU TV, you can watch a documentary that John and I love. It's great. Called That Promise Day. John introduced me to it, and this answered questions I've always had about how our LDS edition of the scriptures came to be. Now, remember that we just read that the Reorganized Church or Community of Christ has the copyright for these documents for the Joseph Smith translation. For us to use them in our scriptures required some cost and permission. In this documentary, James Mortimer, then the president of Deseret Book, tells us about how that came about. Let's tease you with a little clip from it right here. I made a list of all the references that we wish to use. And it's about 800 passages. And went to Missouri one time just on a regular trip and uh, showed it to Richard Howard and said, you know, we're making a new edition of the Bible. And yes, I've heard about that. He said, now we'd like to use uh, the text of these passages. And he said he would need to take it up with their first presidency. We were asking for cooperation and permission, as it were. The fellow at Herald House called and said, I've met with our first presidency, and they have given you permission to use this material, but there will be a fee. The fee that they want is one dollar. So I took a dollar out of my wallet, put it in an envelope, and sent it to them. (laughs) And we were able to use the Joseph Smith translation material, which has been a great help in many ways. I love that. That that. so good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Brother Mortimer, you are awesome. Yep. Well, and that whole story is great. And you get to see Dr. Matthews himself talking about the stories having to do with the bringing forth of Joseph Smith translation. Yeah, it's really interesting. You've got to watch this. And we'll put time codes for a couple of clips in the description if you want to check those out directly. But otherwise, really recommend you watch the whole thing. Absolutely. So there's a common question Why don't we use the Joseph Smith translation as our Bible today? Have you ever wondered that? And Dr. Matthews is quick to point out in his article that we do use portions of it. Certainly, the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Moses, is part of the Joseph Smith translation. Also, Joseph Smith Matthew in Pearl of Great Price. Plus, we've got extended portions of it in our appendix for the Bible and the footnotes. But we don't have the complete... Why do we not use the complete? Well, there's a couple of things that Brother Matthews suggests. First of all, we don't own the copyright, as we just talked about. That's owned by the Community of Christ, or the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Dr. Matthews suggests in his New Era article that we posted that perhaps the principal reason why the church has not published or officially adopted the new translation is that the Prophet Joseph Smith was unable to attend to an authorized publication of it before his death. And he goes on in that same article to suggest that it is also very probable that the Prophet would have made some additional corrections had he lived longer. There's also one other thing to consider, and this also comes from Dr. Matthews, but here's another little teaser clip from That Promised Day. Some of our people had come west 
with their own handwritten copies of certain portions, but almost always they had the original draft. So when the reorganized church published what they called the inspired version, they published it from the finished draft. And so they said the reorganized church has changed it. What they hadn't realized was that the prophet made a, a first draft and then an edited draft. Because of that, there was a certain cloud or stigma resting on the uh, Joseph Smith translation, and so it got very little use in our church. That's amazing. And there you go. And so what's neat about that is he talks about how there's an original draft and then a finished draft or an edited draft. What's neat is at the Joseph Smith papers, you can actually see both, as well as the original Bible that they used. It's really yeah. neat. Yeah. So there you go. The information's there. We definitely encourage any kind of study or reaching out. LDS scholar Thomas Wayman did a lot of work to publish the entire inspired version through permission from Community of Christ and, of course, the Joseph Smith Papers. There's a lot of resources out there. Definitely worth study. Yeah, you'll love it. Hey, let's take a look then as we get into section 37 of a little background to set up the stage for the Revelation. This comes from the Joseph Smith Revelations book in your Gospel Library app. It says, A September 1830 revelation declared that all members of the Church of Christ should gather together into one place. A second revelation decreed that a city, the New Jerusalem, would be located among the Lamanites. Within a month, Joseph Smith sent missionaries to search out the location for the New Jerusalem, understood to be the future gathering place and to preach to the American Indians. Traveling first to northeastern Ohio, these missionaries preached in the areas around Kirtland and Mentor. They remained in Ohio a few weeks and baptized several dozen individuals, many of whom were members of Sidney Rigdon's Restorationist Congregation, before continuing west. After passing through Independence, Missouri, the group attempted to preach to the Indians who had been relocated by the United States government to territory just beyond the western border of Missouri. In late 1830, two of the Ohio converts, Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partridge, visited Joseph Smith in New York, where opposition to the church was intensifying. Rigdon stayed for two months and became Joseph Smith's close confidant, serving as scribe for his revision of the Bible. In late December, Joseph Smith and Rigdon traveled from Fayette to Canandaigua, New York, and there continued work on Joseph Smith's inspired translation of the Bible. Shortly after their arrival, Joseph Smith dictated this revelation, which formally designated Ohio as a gathering place for the Church of Christ. Three days later, on the 2nd of January, 1831, the third conference of the church convened in Fayette, and there Joseph Smith announced the plan to gather in Ohio. So here we go. I noticed that in studying section 37 this time around, that each verse is kind of its own separate thing to talk about. So we're going to do it that way. Verse 1, Behold, I say unto you that it is not expedient in me that ye should translate any more until ye shall go to the Ohio, and this because of the enemy and for your sakes. So let's talk about that one for a minute. First of all, stop translating. What are they translating? The Book of Mormon? No, the Book of Mormon's already out. This would be the translation of the Bible, the inspired translation that Joseph and Sidney were working on. And it's interesting to note that they would have been working on Moses 7 about this time. If you look at the section headers for the various chapters of the book of Moses, you'll notice that in Moses 6, they were working on that from November to December 1830, and Moses 7, they're working on in December of 1830. So this is December of 1830. This is what they're working on. Also, the Ohio. That always seems strange to me, and it should seem strange to modern readers, because we certainly don't refer to states as the Utah or the Wisconsin or the Texas. Well, maybe Texans do that. Texans, you know I love you, <laughs> and I do. Excuse me. I love all y'all. <clears throat> it's brushing up on my Texan. Yeah, that's John's old mission stomping grounds. That's right. Served in Houston, Texas. But anyway, from the Institute Manual, they tell us that the Ohio would be meaning 
the vast Ohio River Valley in northeastern Ohio where Kirtland was located. That seems awkward to us today, probably was not awkward then. And also interesting, the last part of that verse, they're moving to Ohio because of the enemy and for your sakes. Now, because of the enemy, that would seem reasonable that the problem he's referring to is the persecutions that they've been having in New York, and they were intensifying at this time. But and for your sakes, perhaps just the notion of being unified? Sometimes we take for granted travel and communication today. These technologies and advantages that we have today are certainly not as robust back in 1830. And so this would give them an opportunity to work together. Let's go on to verse 2. And again I say unto you that ye shall not go until ye have preached my gospel in those parts and have strengthened up the church whithersoever it is found, and more especially in Colesville. For behold, they pray unto me in much faith. Way to go, Colesville. Nice. Yeah. Now, referencing specific groups in specific locations, that kind of harkens back to New Testament times. That happens a lot in the epistles of Paul and certainly the first part of Revelation. It's kind of neat. Yeah, cool. Going on to verse 3. And again, a commandment I give unto the church that it is expedient in me that they should assemble together at the Ohio against the time that my servant Oliver Cowdery shall return unto them. Wait a minute, where's Oliver? Well, we talked about that before. He had been sent on a mission to the Lamanites, and he had been on his mission at this point for two months. He left in October of 1830. And so he is going to return, and the saints need to be ready for him to return in Ohio. Verse 4, let's wrap it up. Behold, here is wisdom, and let every man choose for himself until I come. Even so, amen. What's interesting about that to me is that while the gathering is a commandment of the Lord, it is not a compulsion. Let every man choose for himself. I have commanded you to gather to the Ohio. Some saints are going to do that. Some won't, but it is our choice. We have the agency. Yeah, and that's really interesting to see how that plays out as we go on. Let's get into section 38, and let me offer some introduction to that, some context from the Joseph Smith's revelations. This revelation, dictated at a church conference in Fayette, New York, came three days after a 30th of December 1830 revelation commanded the church to assemble together at the Ohio. The 2nd of January, 1831 revelation elaborated on the earlier commandment by reiterating the call to gather and promising the members they would be thereafter endowed with power from on high. In his later history, John Whitmer wrote that as Joseph Smith addressed the conference on the 2nd of January and discussed the commandment to move to Ohio as a group, those present desired to know somewhat more concerning this matter. In response, the seer inquired of the Lord in the presence of the whole congregation, and thus came the word of the Lord. Recalling the conference later, Newell Knight noted that we were instructed as a people to begin the gathering of Israel, and a revelation was given to the prophet on this subject. Some church members were reticent to leave their homes and relocate to Ohio, And a few, according to Whitmer, even wondered if Joseph had invented it, the revelation himself, to deceive the people that in the end he might get gain. Several weeks later, a resident of Waterloo, New York, wrote that this command was at first resisted by such as had property, the brethren from the neighboring counties being all assembled by special summons. But after a night of fasting, prayer, and trial, They all consented to obey the holy messenger. Joseph Smith's mother saw the revelation in a positive light. She wrote to her brother Solomon Mack to explain that after they had gathered together, God would come and reign on the earth with them a thousand years. She also indicated, we expect to go away to the Ohio early in the spring. So let's take a look at this. This is then a clarification of the command to gather to the Ohio. Let's start in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, the great I Am, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
the same which looked upon the wide expanse of eternity and all the seraphic hosts of heaven before the world was made, the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes. I am the same which spake, and the world was made, and all things came by me. There are several revelations that have kind of a similar introduction to make it clear to those reading who is talking. As a quick reminder, if you didn't already know, Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, so it's similar to saying the A and Z, the beginning and the end. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from the Lectures on Faith. Now, if you'll recall, in an earlier lesson, the Lectures on Faith were originally the doctrine portion of the Doctrine and Covenants and have since been removed as they were never canonized as scripture. But we know that these lessons were published with the sanction and approval of the Prophet Joseph Smith. And there's a quote that's appropriate here that goes along with the whole concept of the Lord being the same which knoweth all things. The lectures on faith say, quote, Without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures, for it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things, from the beginning to the end, that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him." End quote. That's a great thing to examine and think about. Why is it so important for us to know that God knoweth all things? How does that change our faith in him? How does that change our trust in him? So I think it's really important to look at why the Lord made sure to let the saints know that in verse 2, especially since they might be having questions about the challenging commandment they're being given. Now, remember, just prior to receiving this revelation, Joseph Smith had been working on the inspired revision of the Bible and had received what is now Moses 6 and 7 in the Pearl of Great Price. These chapters give an account of a prophet named Enoch and his people. Because of their righteousness and unity, the Lord called these people Zion. Let's take a look in verse 4 and see how that relates. I am the same which have taken the Zion of Enoch into mine own bosom. And verily I say, even as many as have believed in my name, for I am Christ, and in mine own name, by the virtue of the blood which I have spilt, have I pleaded before the Father for them. Now, why did the Lord say that? If he had created a Zion before for those that believed on his name, couldn't he do it again with these people? Couldn't he do it again with us? Notice what helped make those people a Zion people. They believed on the name of of Jesus Christ and all that that implies. Going on in verse 7, But behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, that mine eyes are upon you. I am in your midst, and ye cannot see me, but the day soon cometh that ye shall see me. At the end of verse 9 is an interesting phrase. He says, Behold, the kingdom is yours, and the enemy shall not overcome. That last phrase, the enemy shall not overcome, really stuck out to me this time around. We just talked about the notion that God knoweth all things. We have all been in situations where we have had somebody try to rally our faith, whether at a, like a sporting event or other events, you have somebody talking to you beforehand saying, you know, you've worked hard, you've done everything that you can. If you give it your all, you'll be able to do your best and you'll win and this kind of thing. And you know deep down in your heart, well, this person doesn't know I'll win, but, you know, they're trying to encourage you. Here is a situation where we have an all-powerful, all-knowing being saying, the enemy shall not overcome. This isn't necessarily just meant to be an encouragement. This is a statement of fact. The enemy shall not overcome because he can't. This has already been played out. So know that this is true. The enemy 
cannot overcome. And what difference will that make in our lives when we can get our head around that? If we worship a God who has power over the enemy, then how much more do we need to be unified with him and be able to draw on that power? You know, in verses 8 through 12, the Lord describes the power of darkness that prevails on the earth prior to his second coming. Verse 12 is of interest in particular. He's talking about those challenges which causeth silence to reign, and all eternity is pained. And the angels are waiting with great command to reap down the earth, to gather the tares that they may be burned, and behold... The enemy is combined. There was a great quote in the Institute Manual from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. This comes from April 1993 General Conference when he talks about that notion of the angels are waiting for the command to reap down the earth. He says, quote, Years ago, I wondered over the scriptural imagery of angels waiting day and night for the great command to come down and reap the tares in a wicked and suffering world. It seemed rather eager to me. Given such massive, needless human suffering, I don't wonder anymore. Even so, the final reaping will occur only when the Father determines that the world is fully ripe. Meanwhile, brothers and sisters, the challenge is surviving spiritually in a deteriorating wheat and tares world. Granted, Occasionally, a few defectors or dissidents may try to vex us as they hyperventilate over their particular concerns, but it is the engulfing effects of that deteriorating world on church members which is the clear and present danger. Evils and designs really do operate through conspiring individuals in the last days. The Lord has even announced, Behold, the enemy is combined. Yet we must not be intimidated or lose our composure, even though the once morally unacceptable is becoming acceptable, as if frequency somehow conferred respectability. End quote. Wow. I love that last line. That's another one of those. It was in 1993, but it's even more true right. today. Right. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Going on in verse 13. And now I show unto you a mystery a thing which is had in secret chambers, to bring to pass even your destruction in process of time. And ye knew it not, but now I tell it unto you. And ye are blessed, not because of your iniquity, neither your hearts of unbelief. For verily some of you are guilty before me, but I will be merciful unto your weakness. Therefore be ye strong from henceforth. Fear not, for the kingdom is yours." Jumping ahead to 28, which I think connects with these verses. And again I say unto you, that the enemy in the secret chambers seeketh your lives. Stephen C. Harper, in his Book of Mormon Central's commentary for the Doctrine and Covenants, said, The revelation brought the crisis to the saints' attention, compelling them to choose, for it described an either-or proposition, to begin the process of becoming like Enoch's Zion, or continue the process toward destruction. To be saved, the New York saints must move to Ohio. In verses 17 through 22, the Lord offers his people an inheritance, a promised land in Ohio. Look what they need to do to obtain it. In verse 19, it says, seek it with all their hearts. And in verse 22, hear his voice, speaking of God, and follow him. Or in other words, as President Nelson so succinctly put it recently, hear him. Yeah. It's interesting that we get a repeat of that. Also in verse 22, we get the assurance, and you shall be a free people, and ye shall have no laws but my laws when I come, for I am your lawgiver, and what can stay my hand? I love that line. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Who's going to stop me? Yeah. Going forward in the next few verses... Look at how this instruction will prepare these people and us to be a Zion people. Verse 23, But verily I say unto you, Teach one another according to the office wherewith I have appointed you, and let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And again, I say unto you, Let every man esteem his brother 
as himself. Did you see Perhaps that? Perhaps the second great commandment, as the Lord told us in the New Testament, maybe? Yeah, and look at that repetition, 24 and 25. Imagine for a minute what happens when people think they are of more value or better than others. And then flip that around. What does it do to our society when every man esteemeth his brother as himself? I think there's an absolutely key component there to becoming a Zion people. Now, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland illustrated the importance of considering every person as someone to serve and love with this story about his 20-year high school class reunion. While efforts were made to contact everyone from the class, he says, I remember the terribly painful letter written by one very bright, but in her childhood, somewhat less popular young woman who wrote something like this. Congratulations to all of us for having survived long enough to have a 20-year class reunion. I hope everyone has a wonderful time, but don't reserve a place for me. I have, in fact, spent most of those 20 years trying to forget the painful moments of our school days together. Now that I am nearly over those feelings of loneliness and shattered self-esteem, I cannot bring myself to see all of the class and run the risk of remembering all of that again. Have a good time and forgive me. It is my problem, not yours. Maybe I can come at the 30-year mark, which I am very happy to report she did. But she was terribly wrong about one thing. It was our problem. And we knew it. I have wept for her, my friend, and other friends like her in my youth, for whom I and a lot of others obviously were not masters of the healer's art. We simply were not the Savior's agents or disciples that he intends people to be. I cannot help but wonder what I might have done to watch out a little more for the ones not included, to make sure the gesture of a friendly word or a listening ear or a little low-cost casual talk and shared time might have reached far enough to include those hanging on the outer edge of the social circle, and in some cases barely hanging on at all. Jesus said in his most remarkable sermon ever, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? I make an appeal for us to reach beyond our own contentment, to move out of our own comfort and companion zone, to reach those who may not always be so easy to reach. This is from an article called Come Unto Me in the April Enzyme, 1998. It's great stuff. Thank you, Elder Holland. Going back to the section, verse 26, note the parable about esteeming others as ourselves. Again, this is to cement in that idea. This is how Zion is going to work. Verse 26, For what man among you, having twelve sons, and is no respecter of them, And they serve him obediently. And he saith unto the one, Be thou clothed in robes, and sit thou here. And to the other, Be thou clothed in rags, and sit thou there. And looketh upon his sons, and saith, I am just? Behold, this I have given unto you as a parable, and it is even as I am. I say unto you, Be one. And if ye are not one, ye are not mine. That is the definition of, of Zion, Moses 7, 18, one heart, one mind, dwelling in righteousness. Be one. The early church members who were called to gather to Ohio came from various backgrounds. Some owned successful farms and were respected in their communities, while others had little property and were considered to be of a lower social class. Why would this instruction be so important to them? if they were to become one. Also, think about the blessings of gathering today, whether it's in our families or whether it's in our church communities. This is maybe more potent today than in any recent history. Right. Let's remember that we were recording this lesson in 2021, and so we're still suffering through the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and gathering together doesn't happen as much anymore. Yeah, there's still a lot of restrictions on it, even when we can. But what a treasure. So you can imagine maybe, thinking in this time frame, imagine what it's like for the saints there, scattered in various locations. Maybe it's time to bring everybody together so that they can become one. Let's go on in verse 29. You hear of wars in far countries, and you say that there will soon be great wars in far countries. But ye know not the hearts of men in your own land. I tell you these things because of your prayers. Wherefore, treasure up wisdom in your bosoms, lest the wickedness of men reveal these things unto you by their wickedness, in a manner which shall speak in your ears with a voice louder than that which shall shake the earth. But if ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. Now there's a line that gets a lot of repetition in the church, and rightly so. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. From the Institute Manual, we have a quote from Elder L. Tom Perry. This comes from October 1995 General Conference. He says, quote, On a daily basis, we witness widely fluctuating inflation, wars, interpersonal conflicts, national disasters, variance in weather conditions, innumerable forces of immorality, crime, and violence, attacks and pressures on the family and individuals, technological advances that make occupations obsolete, and so on. The need for preparation is abundantly clear. The great blessing of being prepared gives us freedom from fear, as guaranteed to us by the Lord in the Doctrine and Covenants. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. Just as it is important to prepare ourselves spiritually, we must also prepare ourselves for our temporal needs. Each of us needs to take the time to ask ourselves, what preparation should I make to care for my needs and the needs of my family? End quote. Now, if that was true in 1995, it is 25 years truer today, and it's amazing how appropriate that is and timely. And speaking of timely... If this discussion reminds you at all of a recent General Conference talk from October 2020, it should. President Russell M. Nelson's talk, Embrace the Future with Faith, tells us, quote, How are we to deal with both the somber prophecies and the glorious pronouncements about our day? The Lord told us how, with simple but stunning reassurance, If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. What a promise! It is one that can literally change the way we see our future. I recently heard a woman of deep testimony admit that the pandemic, combined with an earthquake in the Salt Lake Valley, had helped her realize she was not as prepared as she thought she was. When I asked her whether she was referring to her food storage or her testimony, she smiled and said, Yes. I love that. Oh, what a wonderful saint. That's a great example. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear, so let us prepare. Amen to that. Coming up in verses 31 through 33, note the blessings promised for obeying the commandments to relocate to Ohio. In verse 31, that they might escape the power of the enemy. Also in verse 31, that they would be gathered unto God a righteous people. In verse 32, it says that they would receive God's law and be endowed with power from on high. These are big blessings. The Lord isn't just saying, here, do this. There's a purpose behind this difficult commandment, and it's about helping them to escape the power of the enemy gathered to God, receive his law, and power from on high would endow them. So exciting. In verses 34 through 42, the Lord provided some commandments and counsel for the saints that would assist them in their relocation to Ohio. For many of the saints, their only source of livelihood was their farms. With so many members of the church selling their property at the same time, Many of the saints face the prospect of losing money on their farms or not being able to sell them at all. The abundant supply of land for sale would drive prices down and allow buyers to purchase the saints' farms at a steep discount. 
Originally, I was thinking, what a shocking commandment to have to make such a major move in January. And yet there is a blessing element to it. And that is that if you can get settled into a new property, you'd be ready for spring planting. But you can get a sense of how hard this is. In verses 37 and 39, Notice the tone of the Lord here, how serious he is about this. In verse 37, And they that have farms that cannot be sold, let them be left or rented as seemeth them good. In verse 39, And if ye seek the riches which it is the will of the Father to give unto you, ye shall be the richest of all people, for ye shall have the riches of eternity. And it must needs be, that the riches of the earth are mine to give. But beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. It's interesting that he would have mentioned the Nephites of old. Does this remind you of a sermon from Jacob, the brother of Nephi, about how if you seek riches, ye will seek them for doing the will of the Lord, for clothing the naked and feeding the poor, etc. And this is One of those things that the Lord is reassuring the people as well. Yeah, and many examples, including, you know, having to pack up and leave at various times. And here it is. They're being asked to pack up and leave. In verses 40 through 42, in conclusion, the Lord instructs them to go to with his might, with the labor of his hands, to prepare and accomplish the things which I have commanded. And let your preaching be the warning voice every man to his neighbor in mildness and in meekness. And go ye out from among the wicked. Save yourselves. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Even so, amen. Great instruction. And that phrase, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. From the Institute Manual, I've got a quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. This is from the October 2000 General Conference. He says, quote, Let me tell you what that phrase, bear the vessels of the Lord, means. Anciently, it had at least two meanings, both related to the work of the priesthood. The first refers to the recovery and return to Jerusalem of various temple implements that had been carried into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. In physically handling the return of these items, the Lord reminded those early brethren of the sanctity of anything related to the temple. Therefore, as they carried back to their homeland these various bowls, basins, cups, and other vessels, they themselves were to be as clean as the ceremonial instruments they bore. The second meaning is related to the first, Similar bowls and implements were used for ritual purification in the home. The Apostle Paul, writing to his young friend Timothy, said of these, In a great house there are vessels of gold and silver, of wood and of earth, these means of washing and cleansing common in the time of the Savior. But Paul goes on to say, If a man purge himself of unworthiness, he shall be a vessel, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Therefore Paul says, Flee youthful lusts, follow righteousness, call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In both of these biblical accounts, the message is that as priesthood bearers, not only are we to handle sacred vessels and emblems of God's power, think of preparing blessing and passing the sacrament, for example, but we are also to be a sanctified instrument as well, partly because of what we are to do, but more importantly, because of what we are to be. The prophets and apostles tell us to flee youthful lusts and call on the Lord out of a pure heart. They tell us to be clean, end quote. That's so important. And think, how does understanding this help us prepare to be a Zion people. What difference would that make for us? Stephen C. Harper has some great insights as we finish up this revelation from his Book of Mormon Central Commentary. He says, given the individualistic attitude of the society in which these saints lived, the remarkable fact is not that one or two chafed at the monumental sacrifice of the command to gather in Ohio, but the stunning degree of obedience and sacrifice in response to section 38. 
The Lord had manifested his will to his people, John noted. Therefore, they made preparations to journey to the Ohio with their wives and children and all they possessed to obey the commandment of the Lord. Newell Knight wrote, As might be expected, we were obliged to make great sacrifices of our property. By keeping the command to pull up the telestial roots and forsake telestial concerns, the New York saints were yielding up their selves to God. They were making a bold counter-cultural declaration. By so doing, they prepared themselves to receive the law of consecration the Lord promised to give them when they gathered to Ohio. They were self-selecting to be endowed with power from on high. Now, some of the saints did have difficulty selling their farms after this commandment was given. Some sold their farms at a loss. Others could not sell their property at all. Some faithful members simply left their unsold homes and property and went to Ohio anyway. It's an amazing demonstration of faith and something that we should always remember and something that we may be asked to do again in the future. We'll have to see. In big ways or small. Let's move on to Doctrine and Covenants section 39. Welcome. And we're going to be introduced to a new character here, James Covell. Who was James Covell? Well, from the Institute Manual, we get this summary. When the saints gathered in Fayette, New York, in the early part of January 1831, for the third conference of the church, they discussed the Lord's command for them to move to Ohio. A Methodist minister named James Coville may have attended that conference and afterwards spoke with church leaders. It appeared as though he was prepared to convert to the restored gospel. According to John Whitmer, James Coville covenanted with the Lord that he would obey any commandment that the Lord would give through his servant, Joseph. The prophet Joseph Smith received a revelation for James Coville on January 5, 1831. The earliest copy of the Revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 39 indicated that it was a revelation given for someone named James. The published copy of the Revelation expanded the name of the recipient to James C. In the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, his name was identified as James Coville. In the 1981 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, he was identified as a Baptist minister. However, recent research indicates that this revelation was given to James Covell, who was a Methodist minister. I like that clarification. Yeah, that's interesting. And hooray for all the research that we're doing. Let's take a look right away then in verse 1. Hearken and listen to the voice of him who is from all eternity to all eternity, the great I am, even Jesus Christ, the light of and the life of the world, a light which shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not, the same which came in the meridian of time unto mine own, and mine own received me not. Notice what Christ offered, and what his own people rejected. Think about this as we learn about James Coville's experience. In verse 4, it says that if we receive Christ, we can become his sons. Well, we also know it's We can become his daughters, too. We read about that in Doctrine and Covenants 25.1. But notice here he's speaking to James. So this is wonderfully personalized for him. We become Christ's sons and daughters in Mosiah 5.7 when our hearts are changed through faith on the name of Jesus Christ. Then we are spiritually begotten of him. The question then is, will James fulfill that potential. And while the first part of this revelation focuses on who is talking, in verse 7, he is now addressing James directly. And now behold, I say unto you, my servant James, I have looked upon thy works, and I know thee. And verily I say unto thee, thine heart is now right before me at this time. And behold, I have bestowed great blessings upon thy head. Now, first of all, if you want to insert your own name into those verses, that's an amazing set of statements. I did that already. (laughs) Because it's your name. That's my name. So, from the Institute Manual, there's a quote from then-elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve. This is from 
an Enzyme article in June 1986 called The Desires of Our Hearts. Quote, When is our heart right with God? Our heart is right with God when we truly desire what is righteous, when we desire what God desires. Our divinely granted willpower gives us control over our desires, but it may take many years for us to be sure that we have willed and educated them to the point that all are entirely righteous. End quote. Going on then in verse 9, Nevertheless, thou hast seen great sorrow, for thou hast rejected me many times because of pride and the cares of the world. Remember, this is directed to James Covell, who had been a well-respected Methodist minister for about 40 years. How do you think this went over to hear this? Well, and for those of you who substituted your own name in the previous verses, (laughs) make sure you keep it here, too. Yeah. I think this could apply to all of us. From the Institute Manual, from his landmark talk, President Ezra Taft Benson's talk in April of 1989, Beware of Pride. Wonderful, wonderful talk. He reminds us, quote, The proud cannot accept the authority of God giving direction to their lives. They pit their perceptions of truth against God's great knowledge, their abilities versus God's priesthood power, their accomplishments against his mighty works. The proud wish God would agree with them, They aren't interested in changing their opinions to agree with God's. The proud do not receive counsel or correction easily. Defensiveness is used by them to justify and rationalize their frailties and failures. The proud are not easily taught. They won't change their minds to accept truths because to do so implies they have been wrong. End quote. So important. Well, so as we look into these next verses, 10, 11, and 12, look for the if-then promises. Verse 10, But behold, the days of thy deliverance are come, if thou wilt hearken to my voice, which saith unto thee, Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on my name, and you shall receive my spirit, and a blessing so great as you never have known. And if thou do this, I have prepared thee for a greater work. Thou shalt preach the fullness of my gospel, which I have sent forth in these last days, the covenant which I have sent forth to recover my people, which are of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass that power shall rest upon thee. Thou shalt have great faith, and I will be with thee and go before thy face. Wow, some very powerful promises, but note the if conditions there. Yeah. From the old Institute Manual, this is the 2001 Doctrine and Covenants Student Institute Manual. They have a quote from President Harold B. Lee. This is from General Conference, October 1972, where he says, quote, I sat in a class in Sunday school in my own ward one day, and the teacher was the son of a patriarch. He said he used to take down the blessings of his father, and he noticed that his father gave what he called iffy blessings. He would give a blessing, but it was predicated on if you will cease doing that. And he said, I watched these men to whom my father gave the iffy blessings, And I saw that many of them did not heed the warnings that my father as a patriarch had given, and the blessings were never received because they did not comply. You know, this started me thinking. I went back into the Doctrine and Covenants and began to read the iffy revelations that have been given to the various brethren in the church. If you want to have an exercise in something that will startle you, Read some of the warnings that were given through the Prophet Joseph Smith to Thomas B. Marsh, Martin Harris, some of the Whitmer brothers, William E. McClellan, warnings which, had they heeded, some would not have fallen by the wayside. But because they did not heed and they didn't clear up their lives, they fell by the wayside and some had to be dropped from membership in the church. End quote. That's great advice. 
The last verses, 13 through 24, in section 39, the Lord calls James Covell to preach the gospel in Ohio. The Lord gave him instructions about what to teach and how to teach it. In verse 22, it says, And he that receiveth these things receiveth me, and they shall be gathered unto me in time and in eternity. I wonder how that relates to James himself. With such an invitation and with such great promised blessings, I wonder how he responded. Well, it turns out that we have evidence of his response in our very next section. So welcome to section 40. The Institute Manual gives us this quick summary. On January 6th, 1831, the day after the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 39 was received, James Covell abruptly left Fayette, New York. On that same day, the Lord gave the Prophet Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 40. Wow. And from Revelations in Context, Covell must have known that moving west would mean cutting ties with the deep and extensive associations he had built up over his career. Two of his sons were Methodist preachers, and his years spent working in New York City had put him in contact with the movement's most powerful voices. All the prestige he had accumulated over the course of a lifetime would have to be abandoned. It took Koval less than 48 hours to decide that he would not move to Ohio. Wow. You know, it would be one thing if Joseph had just sought him out and given him this revelation. That would be bad enough. But the idea that he had covenanted to obey whatever commandment Joseph would give him, even more surprising. And let's take a look in verse 1. The Lord reviews that. Behold, verily I say unto you, that the heart of my servant James Covell was right before me, for he covenanted with me that he would obey my word. And he received the word with gladness, but straightway Satan tempted him. And the fear of persecution and the cares of the world caused him to reject the word. Wherefore he broke my covenant, and it remaineth with me to do with him as seemeth me good. Amen. You know, that reminds me of several conferences ago. Do any of you remember in the April 2012 conference, President Henry B. Eyring's talk about mountains to climb and the idea of coming to the Lord and asking for challenges asking for mountains to climb so that you can improve yourself and to ready to go. This is kind of what James Covell did. Yeah, and how important that is to follow through when the Lord does give us an answer to what we lack yet. Stephen C. Harper, in his Book of Mormon Central Commentary, offers this great insight for this revelation. He says, the order of events in section 40 is important. First, James Covell made a covenant with an honest heart. He sincerely received the gospel. Then, Satan tempted him to fear the persecution that would result, to worry about giving up his paid ministry for a lay one. James chose to follow those fears and cares, resulting in a broken covenant. This sequence highlights how revelation facilitates agency. A person has agency or power to act independently only when they know what God wants. Satan poses an alternative and they are free to choose between the two. See section 29. Given section 39, James knew just what the Lord wanted him to do. Then Satan countered the commandments. James was free to choose between the two. He chose to break his covenant, making it null and void. In Revelations in Context, it says, After his fleeting interest in the church, Covell returned to his former position. He preached and gained converts for Methodism in upstate New York until 1836, when he moved back to New York City. He remained there until his death in February of 1850. By then, the saints had moved still farther west, beyond the Rocky Mountains to the arid Great Basin. So there it is. It's interesting how the longer he waited, the further the congregation, the saints, Zion, how further and further it moved away from him. Yeah, that's a very good point. 
Well, let's leave you on more of a positive note. From the Institute Manual, there's a great quote that I wanted to include from President Thomas S. Monson. This is from April 2004 General Conference, his talk, The Call for Courage. He says, quote, We will face fear, experience ridicule, and meet opposition. Let us have the courage to defy the consensus, the courage to stand for principle. Courage, not compromise, brings the smile of God's approval. Courage becomes a living and an attractive virtue when it is regarded not only as a willingness to die manfully, but also as a determination to live decently. A moral coward is one who is afraid to do what he thinks is right because others will disapprove or laugh. Remember that all men have their fears, but those who face their fears with dignity have courage as well. End quote. Thank you, President Monson. And let us all have courage as we move forward in this week. Absolutely. And may your scripture study be blessed with continued insights and personal applications that will help to strengthen us against tough times ahead. Keep reading your scriptures and we'll talk to you more about them at our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>